Hello, hello. There are so many subjects I want to talk about. I don't know if I can cover all of this today, but I need to talk about it for my own personal filing and observations and to have that to look at it later on to see how I was thinking and how I was evolving and also for other people to maybe use and be having some, some something to some reference to feel better no, so some like an acknowledgement that you're not alone and last but not least of course the animal rights things that I mention and discuss so that's the most important subject there is and I'm super self-critical if I see myself say something wrong I'm gonna have to turn the entire video off and then make a new one and that happens quite frequently but I I need to be not so super critical anymore I'm trying to I'm trying to practice this you know, not to be too critical anymore because I see other people make videos they're they're, they're not near as critical <laughs> of themselves as I am so if I say something just ro one time wrong then it's like I'm already beating up on myself and I have to erase it and I feel embarrassed and I already feel embarrassed but this is exactly what I'm working on that's what I want to heal and the only way I can heal it is if I get out of my comfort zone as Sean Stevenson said, you know, we need to get our, out of our comfort zones. And Mel Robbins and Tony Robbins, those are motivational speakers and they emphasize this, which is very important. It's very important to get out of your comfort zone. I'm personally opposed to the technique of flooding. Um, flooding means someone with a certain dislike or phobia has to confront themselves with that very situation that they're afraid of in a flooding way in a in an overload in a the mo the more the overload the more you become desensitized i am against it because obviously as we have seen also with dr drew and those type of people in the OCD project reality shows that was, that was like 10 years ago or something I had almost every single one of these ev I had the symptoms of every person that was there there were six different people with o different OCDs including one person who was borderline I had it all you know I had I could fully identify myself with every single person and um, particularly the borderline guy and the lady was the was the disgust about men <laughs> so but now I'm straying off <laughs> anyway what we see with this the problem is with this Dr. Drew type of shock type of shock and awe uh, psychological treatment is um, it's it's almost as bad as the real shock therapy you know it's like it's it just floods the system to the degree where they are so overloaded and so overwhelmed and and so helpless that they can actually go into a state of shock or, or uh, paralysis of some sort psychological paralysis uh, and then it, it gets real difficult to heal so no this is that is not the approach force is never a good approach with non-humans and 
with humans, so you don't want to use force ever. You have to do a gradual process. It's it's more time consuming. It costs more money. It is tedious sometimes even, but it is well worth it. So, you know, it's a therapy process can never be like one week crash course, but you have to pay $5,000, something like this. People fall for it. It never works. You know, it, it never works when someone forces someone to smile when they absolutely cannot smile. You know, it just is not working at all. It, I'm sorry about this. So it's many people are well-meaning and for and many people do things out of their own abilities that are totally different and often more advanced abilities of self-control and um, mental work and s development and so on. For other people it is much more difficult. You cannot put everyone into the same drawer. You cannot put all these different brains and their abilities into one program and and say okay this should work for everyone now like with Dr. Drew you know he had this one person in there who and, and there there was another girl who was also terrified and I don't know if that was very good for her either but this one guy he ended up throwing up like permanently he was threw up one whole evening until they finally got it oh this guy, you know, he's borderline. He should not be in this OCD crash course group. You know. So that was just way overwhelming for him, what they did with him there. I felt really awful for him. I felt I could just feel how it w what it w would have done to me. I would have had the same reaction. So there's just no way these kind of techniques that these flooding techniques that they did with these people and particularly with the very sensitive guy who, who was all completely overwhelmed or already overwhelmed by the moment he stepped into this treatment center. So, yeah, that's just not, that's just, that's uh, sensationalism. It gets views, you know, it's it's popular, but it isn't helping people the slightest bit. It just makes things even worse. It can cause people to commit suicide and so on. Yeah. So, um, and that's why I do my own therapy process very gradually, and the internet helps me with it. It helps me to make these recordings when I look back on my old recordings I see I have made progress that in itself gives me hope that gets me going then I can proceed with my work very gradually and um, hopefully one day I will be able to give presentations in front of more people which will be live presentations what I'm doing here is not live I'm recording this on my tablet and I don't even have the internet button on. So, but once I'm finished with this, I'm not going to edit it. So this is already a step ahead from the past. In the very beginning, I could not even show my face. I had to, and I could not say anything spontaneously. I was reading from written text that I have written, actually from a book I wrote. I was. I was reading chapters. That in itself was already quite a task for me in the book. So I have gone through many, many increments of healing. It took me a long time. It took me 10 years to come to this point where I am right now. When I was talking to Gary in Mentum and Nick the Modern Mystic back in 2007, 2008, I was still at the place where I could not even show my face. I had to show my arms <laughs> or something else. But at least I was already working towards where I was actually showing something in the room, not just focusing or showing some completely different image, 
that I was focusing my camera on while I was reading. So I was already starting to show, show my arms and even my jacket <laughs> and uh, so then I was working up and then finally was showing my face but then I was still reading and boy it was a very gradual slow process and this fear you know this this incredible fear of making myself look ridiculous or alienating people or Oh, this fear, this is um, very difficult to explain. This, this total insecurity, this fear of myself that, that I am not cohesive or that I am unpredictable in my body movements or facial expression or voice expression it was also much my voice was much more shrill and much more fearful and more abrupt and then even just three years ago my voice was not at all fluent I was very afraid to even ha have one moment of hesitation, which I'm working on now. I allow this hesitation now, because if I don't allow even this, a moment of thinking and not talking, then um, that's okay, you know, and that gives me space to ponder over things without freaking out over my own blackouts or something. That was a whole lot worse even just two years ago, and then very gradually it's healing up. And if we don't do this work, you know, we just cause ourselves to become more and more unempowered and more fearful, actually. So, in that sense, I am very much in agreement with the motivational people Sean Stevenson, Mel Robbins, and Tony Robbins. So it's very important. Their approaches are a little different to mine, you know, they because the reason why is because they have different brains. You know, they have their brains are much more confident from the start. So Sean Stevenson has physical disabilities which pushed him forward and because of his brain that he has, is an amazing brain. He was able to make something amazing happen in his life. So he's very, very outgoing, very extrovert, very loving, very uncritical of people, uncritical of himself. You know, being too critical of yourself is just it's just a hindrance. David Foster Wallace comes to mind immediately. You know, someone who is way too critical of himself. That just blocks you in your in your tracks. It's like it puts you into a into a mud trap, literally. You know, you're you are trapped like a truck in a in mud, and in, in brain works the same way. It's brain mud. So, and then you cannot get out. You know, no matter how much force you try, you get stuck more and more and more into this brain mud and um, that is awful awful bad it's like it creates its own obstacles so there are all these things to pay attention to that is very very important and so but David Foster Wallace certainly that is someone who I identify myself 100% with because of this hyper self -critic critical mindset and I saw when he was getting bad before his suicide I saw him on Charlie Rose I think that was I don't know which year it was but it must not have been very far from the time when he got really badly out of control with this self 
criticism and this fear and it became so bad in the end that he couldn't even leave the house anymore and I know I have been there many times and then it just gets worse from there because the less we push ourselves out of that comfort zone you know even in little increments we have to we must do it in little increments not in big increments not in big leaps that causes flooding we have to do it in little increments but we have to do it if we don't do it then we are completely stuck just like a truck that is stuck in sand or mud you know it is not the the one forceful leap that gets it out it just gets it more into the into the mud it is the tiny little increments that gets it out and everyone helping you know every you have to like the the metaphor for everyone helping with the truck in the mud for the brain is you have to use everything that you can use every helper you can you can use for this and every little increment that you can use you know little things you know people will dismiss some things because it's not so much on their wavelengths but do it anyway you know when I see someone like for example, I did primal therapy, and when I saw Tony Robbins first, I thought, oh, this is just one pyramid scheme type of Hilton hotel uh, uh, conference type of motivational speaker who is 100% with the corporations and Monsanto or something like this. But that's always my first impression, you know, the 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 incredibly eloquent infomercialist. So with his Rolex and and this just picture this fake hotel and um, and and the tackiness and all of this all you know this impression of non-genuine you know so with primal therapy I was quite spoiled in the way that that was an approach that went very very deep so and then to see Tony Robbins but I had to use Tony Robbins to get out of primal therapy believe it or not because otherwise I would have been stuck in the mud of primal therapy and primal therapy has its its validity and it helps to some degree very much but only to some degree because if we if we are too stuck and focused on on childhood trauma just as it is with psychoanalytical therapies in general Primal therapy is a psycho psychoanalytical therapy, but it is it goes deeper than that. So it's not stuck with just talking about it. It goes much deeper. But it is it can become very dangerous if it's not conducted right. And um, Arjanov was leaving, and because he left, and people started to blame the clients for when things went wrong and that was just not going anywhere so I had to get out otherwise I would have probably committed suicide and my husband helped me with this and I'm deeply grateful to him I don't know what would have happened if I had not met Paul so Paul got me the book Awaken the Giant Within and alone the title already you know something that is like on the opposite end of of that what how I would ever describe myself you know so I was um, I was a timid frog on the inside so <laughs> and um, but the book was even though it feels funny and it feels like it's not on your wavelength do it anyway, you know. If it is something positive, 
and if it's not on your wavelength, do it. Because even if it doesn't seem to ha have any fruits for you at all in the beginning, even if it feels like, oh, this is this is just like walk walking in a Hilton hotel, or this is just like eating pale cake or whatever, <laughs> or staring at something bleak, you know. Do it anyway, it's it's very important, even if it appears to not do anything, it does something. It does something deep inside. So little in little increments again, you know. And we don't notice it until the increments have reached your conscious awareness. And then you go, ah, so maybe he has helped me. Maybe this has brought me up to a higher level of, of self-perception. So in, in that way, I think it's very, very important you know, that people check out the motivational speeches by Sean Stevenson, Tony Robbins, and Mel Robbins. And those are amazing people, really. And they have a different brain, you know, they don't come from this, they don't come from complete collapse of self-esteem. They, they've always had self-esteem in the brain, so they always had this, and, and my bet is they had mothers who loved them unconditionally when they were infants. It's very interesting, I asked Mel Robbins earlier today, I I would love to talk to her, I don't know if she has time, but I, I would love to know whether she had a mother who gave her that infant unconditional love, you know, that mother love, and that means carrying a baby on your chest. Uh, an animal baby or a human baby when in their most vulnerable time in their lives. That's the foundation for someone's life. So if they are carried around, never left alone, not even for a minute, and there used to be such insane lack of knowledge in the field of clinical psychology. When I first went to the university, the TU Berlin, back in, before I ever came to the United States, when I was 25, I went to the university in Berlin, and that, that professor in general psychology talking, still talking about Skinner and Watson at that time. I mean, it's hard to imagine, you know, it was, the, the year was 1990, 1990 or 1991, and they were still talking about Skinner and Watson and quoting them and thinking that is the way to do it. I was, you know, me coming from Annalise Budapeste and Primal Therapy Approaches and Le Boyer and uh, the books by Dr. Arthur Janoff, for me it was just, and also my inner instinct told me that that uh, Leboyi and Janov and Annalise were right and and all the other people were still with their head in in completely in the dust and this professor just blew me away how they could, how, the, how they could possibly still be teaching something from the 50s so then I went back to university a couple of years later after I had been in primal therapy for 3 years in in LA I went back to Germany because I took some classes at SMC, but it cost me a fortune, and it's just ridiculous if I can have the study program for free in Germany, which is socialized, and just had to pay a few cents for paper, that's all, and for the books, but other than that, the program that was all free was, was governmentally paid paid by my parents' tax money and so on. Why should they pay any more? And so we need that here in the United States. We need online schools, desperately. They need to be free. But anyway, I went, when I went back, I was amazed to see in the class of developmental psychology that they have already made a leap 
in just these three to four years. So they made made a huge leap towards Le Boyer, and I was really thrilled and amazed to see this. So Frederic Le Boyer, I recommend his books to people, particularly he's, he, he became famous because of his idea of underwater birth, and that's just a very natural process and a very gradual and, and a very beautiful transitional process for an infant to be born. So g not going, not coming straight out into a cold, ice cold air and, and with harsh noises and all of this. And so instead with classical music, with soothing voices, with without any harsh sounds, without any harsh uh, operating room instruments, torture instruments all around and and bleakness. And so instead being born in a jacuzzi, you know, that is that that has body temperature of like ninety seven or ninety eight degrees Fahrenheit. Could maybe could be up to hundred, I don't know. But um, that is a beautiful way of being born, and those babies, they did not scream, see, and they used to think in the 50s, the babies needed to scream to get the air in, or some complete backwards, uh, uninform uh, anti-information. So, no, the babies when they are born, the gentle way, they do not scream, and they still breathe. <laughs> they smile, actually. I've seen it in footage the, that our professor was showing us. I was very delighted to see that. So, yeah, progress has happened, and it has progressed since then even more tremendously and the message has gotten around the globe and it is taught in more universities now and people and neurologists and psychologists know this now, most of them at least. And um, it's uh, things are progressing and babies are, more babies are born the gentle way too many babies are born anyway, so I personally decide not to have kids. I recommend to other people not to have kids because we have overpopulation. But that's a different subject altogether. You can also sometimes be the nurse for your dog. And um, some people have pregnant dogs. I don't recommend to breed any animals because there's an overpopulation and they end up suffering or being euthanized in shelters. So, but for those people who happen to come across by, through any kind of, you know, situation, either by chance or they, have, they see puppies or make sure those puppies stay with the mother until they're completely do not need to drink the milk from the mother, from the mother's memories. So it's very, very important to keep baby with mother with the memories, to do breast free feeding, have that available for the baby all the time. And this physical contact is so incredibly important. We didn't need the Harlow monkey studies to prove that, you know. What a horror, some sadistic person. I think that Harry, Harry Harlow was a sadistic person. You know, I can't explain that any other way because it was so unnecessary. Those studies in the 60s, I don't even want to get into it. I describe it in my book, News from Betty, so I'll put the link under this video anyway. I want people to read it because it's free, you know, because it will save your child's life, it will save your your infant's life. Could be a squirrel baby you're rescuing. Make sure that infant, baby, animal or person, human person, animal person or human person is secure on your chest and 
there are some amazing people I saw on YouTube who rescue wild baby animals who had been abandoned, could be deer, baby deer or baby squirrels or baby rats or mice or baby birds and so on. And or baby wombats, those are amazing. So they look like the sculptures by Patricia Piccinini and I'm sure she got inspired by baby bomb wombats, those are amazing, amazing beings. So when you find baby animals, make sure the most important thing is don't ever leave them alone, not even for a few minutes. They have to be on your chest at all times. Very important. You know. This cannot be stressed enough. It's so incredibly important. This is the foundation for any living being's life. So, and I back to the, my former subject, and the subject that I am very fascinated with is David Foster Wallace. Such a beautiful mind and soul, and such a highly gifted person and prodigy and genius. And he had to suffer like this, and he had to die like this, you know. I mean, that was absolute terror and torture that he has gone through, and it those things can be avoided, you know. It can be avoided if we give our baby beings that touch and love in the very first years of our lives, you know, this permanent touch, this assurance, I am here for you, you are not alone, I have you on my chest, you know, so long until you can't carry them anymore, until they get too heavy. Right? And then, even then, you don't want to leave them alone, unattended. So, that is the foundation. If David and I had this nurturing, this mother love, we would not have ended up the way we did. Yeah. I almost died too. You know, I have two suicide attempts you know, behind me. I could have died. So, um, and I almost did if someone had not helped me, you know, if, if I had been alone, that would have knocked me away, for sure. So the one time I ended up in the emergency room, and a, a wonderful woman from Hanover, Germany, who happened to be in L.A. too, helped me, and who was the head nurse in that, in that emergency room, and boy, was I! She saved my life. That woman, I think Ulrike was her name. And the second time, my it was my husband rescuing me. You know, shaking me on my on my shoulder, shaking my shoulder like heck. Wake up! Shaking my body. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Come back to your consciousness. And so, yeah, that's what made me come back to consciousness. And then he gave me Dr. Schultz's charcoal tablets, and, and that pulled me through. So, yeah, and in the hospital they gave me charcoal drink. That was not very good. It wasn't as good as Dr. Schultz's stuff, but, yeah, that was good, too. It, it deactivated the, the poisons. I took pharmaceutical pills, about 100. I thought that would do me away, but it didn't. They were <laughs> the kind that were, they were already the kind that were non-lethal in, in 2003. So th those were new medications. But yeah, it caused permanent neurological damage. And maybe it's healing up now, finally, very slowly. Because I take clay every day. I make sure of that I take different clays. I take zeolite, diatomaceous earth, and sodium bentonite clay every day, and it's that is healing up these neurological damage problems that I have been carrying with me from this poisoning that happened in my nervous system from the modern things like Risperdal and Risperdal is really the absolute worst you can imagine. They should be sued, these people who made that. And uh, don't even want to think, of, I don't even want to think about the rhesus monkeys that 
they they uh, tested this hor horrific stuff on you know, these poor race monkeys, the seizures that those monkeys must have gone into and brutally died from those who, and and I want everyone to know when you take pharmaceutical drugs and when you take antidepressants or antipsychotic drugs it is tested to the core with animals all of those things you know and no one talks about it it's always it's always so uh, nicely pushed under the rug but the animals had to suffer for that and it doesn't even help anyone so it's it, it's just all around a complete as, as tony robbins would call it a class four experience you know something that doesn't feel good something that is not good for you something that is not good for others and certainly something that is not doesn't help the greater good so that's why it's like um, animal testing needs to be outlawed that's absolutely for sure we must work on this we must work on giving animals personhood rights I have a petition, I'll also put this under this video. Petition on care too. We got 500, about 560 signatures. We, we want to get 1,000. Please give your signature for this, okay? This, you, this will not send you to hell or it won't uh, punish you in Bardo or uh, whatever people believe, you know? So it will it will give you actually it will work off, work off some of your sankaras it will give you it will straighten out your karma actually it will make make you feel better and it will put you into a better mindset and it will feel good to help i helped you know with the signature i helped makes me feel good you know every signature i i give so every petition I make, it's an amazing feeling, and I wish everyone would do it. But yeah, anyway, lots of subjects to discuss. I, I don't even know how to address all of this, but all of this is important. The most important is that we give animals personhood. Then the other subjects are keep your animal on your chest when the animal is an infant. Animal, including human animal. So keep him on your chest. You can get a backpack or like a, a chest pack or a, some kind of class uh, thing that you use to wrap the being into. And um, so I've seen different things that people use to carry the baby infant on the chest. And the chest is the best, best better than the back because the chest then they can they can be with your heart, they can be on your solar plexus, they can feel your heartbeat, they feel you, you know, they they, they see your face, they hear your voice and also for breastfeeding very important. So anyway, I don't want to make this video too long. I will talk about more about David Foster Wallace tomorrow. Take care. Peace out.